hello everyone uh, firstly i would like to thank all the participants for joining the call today it's a very special day because with me i have mr webber sangvi and uh, well he doesn't need any sort of introduction because he is known for generating alpha which is very very risk adjusted especially in an environment like this when the markets are so volatile he's been doing it for ages now more than a decade that he's generating consistently you know alpha at the regular interval so what i thought is uh, today uh, you know weber what we do is at aif and pms experts in the is uh, is is organize these knowledge based sessions basically and idea is to educate and empower the investor community as a whole you know so well in the mutual fund industry uh, you don't have to really talk about arbitrage fund because uh, you know that has now been into existence for over two decades and people are taking the advantage of those kind of funds however when it comes to alternate investing funds there is this category called absolute return fund strategy you know which most of the investors especially among the hni community is not so familiar maybe perhaps due to uh, maybe a lack of awareness i would say or maybe they are familiar but not do not know how to go about utilizing this opportunity you know but if you look at the entire globe especially i mean i have learned this from you as well in the previous conversation that if you look at the developed economies this category has emerged as one of the largest category which is called you know absolute return and and so called long shot strategies so uh, so what we'll do is today uh, we've invited all our investors and i can see there are 41 of them who have joined in today and the other people are just joining in now so idea is that when we talk about long shot strategy we thought what, who would be the best person than you because you are heading as a as a, you know you are the lead portfolio manager at avendus capital alternate strategies and managing these uh, long shot strategies a and b is you bring about more than two decades of experience when it comes to uh investments in equities and more particularly in uh, in the you know long shot category uh so we thought uh, we'll invite and so thank you so much for accepting our request and taking the time out from your busy schedule and and joining in today so thank you thank you vikas i think uh, it's a pleasure to be here and you know chatting up with you and and trying to educate uh, or probably share my knowledge uh, about long shot funds how they have kind of evolved and you know uh, you know how an investor needs to kind of look at it as well yeah sure so before we come to uh, you know uh, the strategy uh, just wanted to know so you before joining a vendor 6 years back you have had an experience of managing this category in your previous organization as well if i am not wrong which is ambit and then you work with dsp also manage the proprietary money so if you could uh, give us a sense that how it began and then we'll come to the strategy and discuss in detail about that sure vikas so i think the journey about or for long shot fund uh, actually started uh, you know way back in 2005 and 2006 actually uh, when i was uh, you know looking after the proprietary trading book of dsp merlinch uh, on, on those days uh, what happened is basically that uh, you know why that proprietary trading desk was part of this whole global uh, you know uh, global uh, capital which was pretty large uh, it was then when we first got an exposure towards you know trading markets both on the long and the short side right and it's an interesting uh, you know and an interesting i would say story behind it is basically my first try kind of uh, regional a uh, boss or uh, the, the business head uh, who was in new york uh, did ask me a simple question that whether do you uh, you know could you do long short uh, in the indian markets you know uh, being a little naive and not having much knowledge about long short then i said yeah of course i mean it's very easy to do it so he said no i am just talking about doing long short simultaneously at the same point in time and i was wondering Uh, why is he asking that purely because if the markets are bullish uh, why do you need to go short in uh, if your markets are bullish you would go probably long and if the markets are bearish you go short uh, and and and, and uh, what followed later on is basically no he said that he directed me saying that you need to do long short simultaneously because across various market cycles pick me one trader pick me one investor who is consistently uh being calling the tops and the bottoms of the markets virtually no one can right 
So it is very hazardous to guess that when the market comes down, you will go short, and when the market goes up, you will go long. Well, because one is never sure, uh, you know, of the direction which is coming about the market. The market's being so, uh, it's extremely difficult to predict, right? I'm not, I'll never say impossible, but uh, it, it, it's virtually impossible, I would say. Right. So that is when how the whole background of long short investment started. Uh, that kind of followed up uh, later on, and, and it came from into prominence uh, on the public side when uh, the and when our respectable organization uh, SEBI came out uh, with these you know very forward looking guidelines, which is alternative investment fund guidelines, and that gave us the first opportunity in my erstwhile organization to launch one of the first long short funds in India. We started with a poultry sum of about 20 crores, and now we are at about uh, 5,000 crores only in one flagship product. And now subsequent products and strategies which we have yeah. launched under the whole uh, long short fund umbrella as well. So that's the short journey, Vikas, for you. Sure, great, great, great to know that, uh, you know, uh, so what we want to do is we want to learn from you today how does a long short strategy work, say, uh, you know, and how to take the advantage of, of the strategy? So, because I think, uh, you know, when we talk about long short, right, it's a very loose term and people use it in a very loose fashion. Uh, people think that long short strategy is only one strategy, right, uh, uh, at a one desired product level. However, one needs to be, understand it, you know, very amply clear that long shot is just a tool to actually manage strategies across the risk spectrum right what do i mean by that is basically with long short kind of approach one can operate a very conservative strategy to a very aggressive strategy as well right it depends upon the product configuration the objective of the fund is how you use the long long shot as an approach now, the basic fundamental uh, fundamental around the long short strategy is basically it's as simple as that that something on basis of either fundamental, technical, quant based approach, whatever approach you may call it, you would go long on the stocks you like for various reasons, right? At the same time, uh, on the other side, which is short, you will go short on the stocks which you would not like. Right, so that's the very basic concept of going long in the stocks and the sectors and the markets when you feel that the uh, the trade is in that direction, and going short in the sectors, uh, stocks, and markets uh, when you feel uh, you know markets are not going to do well. A combination of both approaches simultaneously is a long short fund, right, which has the ability to generate uh, the so-called risk-adjusted return very consistently. So the other thing which I was looking at, uh, you know, especially your uh, long shot fund, which is called Avenger's Absolute Fund Strategy. And I can see that over the last four years that I have been kind of, you know, recommending my investor to invest has been generating returns which are not double digit. In fact, 13, 14 percent, you know, at times it has ended up delivering 15 percent consistently despite so much of volatility. Now, how is it possible? to generate 13, 14, 15 percent returns so consistently. Can you throw some more lights on that? Sure, because I think an interesting question here. Now, when I talked about, you know, long short strategies or, you know, let's, the, you know, we said about having positions both on the long and the short side simultaneously, right? And let me kind of delve a little deeper into that thesis a little later. Before that, what I would say is basically whenever you are investing into equity markets, right, on an overall basis, there are basically two types of risks which you encounter with. One is your market risk and the other one is your stock risk. Generally, generally you would be able to categorize any type of risk within these two umbrellas uh, which affects the markets and the returns which you generate from those markets, right? Now, when we talk about, and I will give you one example of each, when you talk about market risk, any movement on the market having a commensurate effect on your portfolio is your market risk, right? For example, 
uh, in a an, uh, COVID uh, month, which happened in March 2020, markets came down by 23-24% in a single month, right? Now, because of that market fall, your portfolio would also have gone kind of affected, uh, which is a great example of market risk, right? As I said, the other piece is basically the stock risk. In a stock risk, if you're investing into a stock A, stock B or stock C, something happens to that stock, uh, whether it's on the positive side or on the negative side, it tends to affect the returns you generate from the portfolio, right? So any change or, you know, or any risk which is emanating from a single stock and the development in the single stock is basically your stock risk aspect of investing, correct? Now, within these two, you will have largely uh, all types of risk covered, right? Uh, when you are investing into equities. So from absolute return fund, and coming back to your question now, is we specifically target both these aspects of risk and have tools which kind of mitigate both these aspects of risk as well. What we do is basically having constant hedges uh, and probably, you know, uh, taking or, or not participating in an event which has the potential to take the market up or down by a huge percentage, we tend to kind of mitigate the market risk. At the same time, having a thorough process and a right, tight risk framework around single individual stocks is how we take care with the stock risk aspect. And because of both these two, uh, you know, uh, or both uh, both these uh, mechanisms around mitigating these risks, we reduce the volatility of the fund to a great extent, and thereby the drawdowns as well. While if a market is sharply up, you may not make that kind of return, but when the markets are down, you don't participate downside as well, which inherently creates that kind of alpha, right? So. Which is why, if you see from 2012-13 till date, no single year we have been negative in terms of returns, right? Uh, which, is, yeah. which is which is what it talks about the risk management on the overall strategy. So that's a remarkable achievement, I would say, Weber, that you know when I look at when I was doing due diligence myself and when I looked at last seven eight years of data points. Honestly, initially, it was very, very difficult for me to digest the fact that there is something called this category, which has been continuously generating, uh, you know, alpha and consistently delivering risk adjusted returns at the regular interval and not even single year. In fact, when I looked at there was not even single quarter those days, I'm talking about 2020, when the strategy has gone and delivered negative returns. Continuously, I'm talking about three months in a row or something like that. So the, uh, that's a great strategy. So, you know, knowing the fact that the minimum threshold in AIF is one crore defined by the regulator. Uh, now, there are many uh, high net worth or ultra HNI investors. They invest money in arbitrage fund of mutual funds. Now, this question comes from their end. So I'm doing a role of messenger here. So can you just throw some more lights in terms of how different this uh, strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the arbitrage fund offered by most of the mutual fund companies in India. Sure. So let's talk about arbitrage fund first to understand that. And then I'll tell you what is the difference between our strategy and an arbitrage fund. In an arbitrage fund, the cash and the future. So for example, you buy uh, the same stock in the cash and sell the same stock in the future, thereby capturing only the spread between the cash and the future. Right, which is nothing but basically the carrying cost of the future, which is your interest cost or whatever the cost you may probably term it as, uh, you know. So in an arbitrage fund, your return potential is restricted to the ability of the spread, which is available between the cash and the future segment of the same security. Right. So that is why if you see over the last two years or three years, uh, the arbitrage funds on a gross basis would have delivered about 3.5 to 4% and I'm sure you are more capable in stating these numbers than me. But you would have those kind of mota moti those kind of numbers uh, uh, and I don't think there is big uh, 
scope of up, uh, surprise either on the upside or on the downside there. You can broadly expect returns in that kind of range. Whereas, in our case, what we do is, it's a fundamental long short strategy where what we go long on is are the sectors and the stocks which we like from a fundamental perspective and what we go short on are the sectors and the stocks which you would not like from the fundamental perspective. Right? So both these stocks, both on the long side and the short side are different as compared to an arbitrage fund where your long stocks and the short stocks are the same. That's the basic difference between these two strategies. Having said that, in terms of the risk, right, we, uh, you know, the absolute return strategy is slightly more riskier uh, than your arbitrage fund purely because at the end of the day, you are taking a call both on the long side and the short side uh, for the markets and for the securities, right? However, from a 12 month perspective, you know, things kind of even out. And that is where if somebody wants to invest, uh, you know, into, from a 12 month perspective into an arbitrage fund, who would probably get about three to 4% anyway between post tax return, we would probably be able to generate and we have generated and our objective would be to generate uh, anyway between six to seven, seven and a half percent kind of post tax post fee return, which is about 200 to 250 basis points higher for the additional amount of risk which you, you may be probably taking as well. No, but here if you look at the fund arbitrage fund, we are talking about pre-tax and when we are talking about long short, we are talking about post fees and post expenses, Correct. you know, so which is six and a half. So to my mind, as a wealth management outfit, I would say that the difference is almost 300 beeps as we speak today. So, so uh, that's a huge number. I mean, uh, looking at the category. So uh, the other thing is, so you know, how do you uh, see? One is that you, you know, one important point that you rightly mentioned that you go long on uh, industry where you, there, there are tailwinds, and then you go short on the strategy where you, there are too many headwinds, maybe coming from regulatory side or maybe coming from uh, different Correct. external uh, factors. Uh, whereas in arbitrage, it's all about just uh, a spread that you try to kind of capture on so it's absolutely no comparison this is not an apple to apple comparison at all so for those uh, in individual investors who asked me this question please make a note of this the other thing is so how do you uh, navigate uh, the volatility i think so generally in indian context indian investor looks at volatility as the biggest enemy but i think for this fund it becomes a friend so how do you how what's your take on that Sure. So when we talk about volatility in terms of the returns, right, uh, we have to kind of come back to the same point that you are doing your long and short stocks simultaneously into a portfolio, right? What effectively it does is basically, uh, and let me give you a few numbers around it actually. On a net exposure basis, which is my long positions minus short positions, my average exposure over the last probably say eight years, nine years, have been in the range of about 15 to 20%, right? Which is my average exposure. When I talk about the net exposure, my beta is even lower as well. So effectively what happens is, irrespective of where the market goes, whether it is on the upside or on the downside, because of my low, very net exposure and a low beta as well, which accompanies that, I'm not exposed to the market risk into a great extent, right? And when you're not exposed to the market risk to a great extent, obviously the volatility on the portfolio will dramatically come down. Again, let me give you a few numbers around this. My fund actually has, over the last five years, uh, has generated the returns of whatever you've said uh, with a volatility of close to about three to 3.5%. So how does this kind of compare with other instruments? Nifty volatility is close to about 15 to 16% on an average, right? Now, if you talk about any short-term product or a duration product, their volatility is between 3 to 5%, right? So that is the kind of volatility we will see uh, from our, our strategy. Again, why we can do is purely because of the ability to do go long and short simultaneously, thereby reducing 
to a great extent the risk associated uh, you know, while investing into equities. Yeah, so uh, as a fund house, you have both the strategies, which is one long shot, the other one is enhanced. So can you also just spare a minute on how does the enhance work? And, and I remember during the COVID time, you're the only fund manager who had uh, you know, almost sitting on who had taken the cash call of almost hundred percent. I remember and hedged the entire portfolio. But any chance that you replicate this in the long only of enhanced, or you keep the long only as it is, and whatever you want to do, you do it in the long shot. How does it work? Perfect. That's a great question because again, now when we spoke about we spoke about a lot about absolute return and the conservative nature uh, of absolute return, right? And I also mentioned. That long shot is just an approach, right? It's an approach towards managing strategies which are very conservative, like absolute return, to aggressive, which are like an enhanced return product, right? What basically an enhanced return does is basically it, it tries to generate returns which are equity plus with a risk which is equity minus. And here, when I'm talking about risk, the whole focus is on drawdowns. Now, drawdown meaning the negative return you achieve in a particular month. So, for example, for us, we define drawdown as negative returns you generate in, in, in one month, right? So, what we focus is basically while, say, for example, equity on a longer term basis makes, say, 11% return. I'm just giving it as, a, as an index, right? My aim would be to generate higher returns than Nifty, but at the same time, during sharper drawdowns, there's a sharper correction in the market, when the, say, for example, market falls by, say, 10%, 15% in a particular month, my intention or my objective would be to fall lesser, much lesser than what the market have fallen as well. Here, what I'm also to say, do tell is basically, and always tell, is that you will, you may witness much more negative ones than as compared to your absolute return purely because here the intention is to replicate or better the returns uh, from benchmark perspective, right? So that's one. Second, uh, in our newer avatar of enhanced return fund, what we have done is basically we have segregated the portfolio into two pieces, right? Which is 85% long only and 15% long short. Now this 15% long shot, I mean, one of the most interesting things which we have done here is basically a trend following system, meaning that if the market goes up, that 15% long shot will kind of leverage and take an exposure on the positive side. If the market goes down, again it will leverage and take a exposure on the negative side, right? Thereby capturing returns if the market goes up on an enhanced basis and protecting uh, the returns of the 85% uh, when the market goes down by shorting it aggressively with that, uh, you know, long short piece. Okay. So that's what we have kind of uh, renewed change in the newer portfolio. The one caveat which I'll always say is why my 15% long short position is a trend following system. Whenever the markets are range bound with very high volatility in between, you will see this strategy probably underperforming for a short period of time. Yeah. But otherwise, the, to capture the trend either on the upside or the downside, this strategy is a great fit uh, on an overall equity allocation for anybody into their portfolios. But what if, let's look at if the call goes wrong, on, you know, let's say you take a positive call and the market goes negative. So what kind of uh, 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 you know, impact it can have on the long only portfolio. So of course, again, a fantastic question because is basically, you know, that 15% when I talk about a trend following system, what we have done is to eliminate the subjective element of investing either on the positive side or on the negative side. We've devised this 15% based on algos. Okay. So this is something there has been extensive testing which we have done. And what we do think is basically on this 15%, looking at the numbers, uh, our past track record suggests that it generates nine or on an average, right, about nine to 
absolute return with that 15 percent okay irrespective of markets uh, whether it is going up or down so what it effectively does is basically it becomes a great value add to your existing 85 percent again to your question that if the call goes wrong uh, i think because uh, okay maybe uh, again to your question right then uh, you know because it's a trend following system and happens on an algo basis right it automatically gets hit pretty uh, you know in terms of the stop losses pretty fast and it, it is kind of a very disciplined and an institutional approach right so we have seen various periods of time of volatility trend direction the strategy has stood uh, you know perfectly in line with our expectations uh, across different market cycles. Uh, because I think you are on mute. Maybe last question from my end and then we'll open the forum for Q&A. And I would request uh, all the investors, if you have any questions, please type in your questions in Q&A box. Yeah, or maybe you can write in the chat box. Uh, we'll take the question. So last question from my side, Bebha, when I heard you a couple of times and I know that you've gone on record during the COVID time, the kind of cash call that your fund house has taken during during those, uh, you know, bad times of lockdown, etc. Now, what are the parameters or the indicators broadly that you look at or that gave you sense that's, you know, so when all the fund managers were really curious what was happening about what was happening in and around the markets your fund house and you gone on record and said that look this is the time that you should have this much exposure to cash and come out of equities etc so what are the indicators broadly that you look at or technically if you would like to just share sure. some of them so because i think uh, one of the and again this is one of the very few parameters which we generally look there are not many parameters we generally look on the overall basis but something um, you know global volatility index right now and this comes by our own experience in terms of our understanding and learning uh, across market cycles, right? And in 2008, and I'll relate that example to as well, you know, whenever this the whole GFC happened, global financial crisis kind of happened, at that point in time, we saw that the volatility kind of spiked up, right, to ridiculously high level, I mean, 60%, 70%, and remained elevated, you know, at, at, at a higher, very higher level. You know, thereby what happens is basically global fund, uh, you know, global fund houses uh, follow the volatility very, very closely. So if there is a higher volatility, that is the value at risk kind of goes up and you then kind of go and degross the, uh, you know, book, which means you kind of just reduce the kind of uh, overall, uh, you know, investment book. So we track this, you know, on a very close level and whenever you see these, uh, or whenever you see this volatility index kind of spiking up and remaining elevated for a considerable period of time, red flags have to come about saying that this is not the right time to kind of be invested in. And if you then go back now in the February end or uh, and March beginning, uh, when we saw volatility kind of spiked up right from 14-15% right up to 70%. And remained elevated at those levels. And that's why you saw a simultaneous degrossing of books across asset classes. Right? So that is just one parameter, uh, you know, one can definitely have a watch on. Of course, there are many other things as well. But this is something which is uh, important. I thought I, I can share it with you guys as well. Sure. So a couple of questions. So the first question comes from Mr. Anand. Do you short based on business cycles? No, of course, see, business cycle, I would say, is just one part or one variable amongst many others to take a decision on whether to short or not, right? Now, uh, even if the business cycle might have turned, right, uh, to the negative side, but if I find a commensurate industry, right, which is even worse than this, then probably I might choose something else rather than shorting this. Right. So it is one while, you know, absolute analysis about where the business cycle is, where the sector is, where the stock is. 
It is also important to see in the relative context of how the other sectors in the stocks are also behaving. Next question is the FI's exposure to India has gone down to less than 18%. Hmm. I think he's talking about the overall holding. So what's your sense? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very important one because if you see from a last seven month perspective, the negative flow or the flow on a cumulative basis from the secondary market have been uh, you know, in excess of 30, 30, $35 billion, right? Uh, and because of which the peak ownership of FII in say Nifty, which was at about 21% and more, is now got reduced to about 18 percent right now this 18 percent actually uh, if you go back in history you will find that this 18 percent ownership is close to at about 2012 2013 levels okay so why yeah, it was even 2008 also i remember it yeah. during so lemon brother crisis correct why this is this selling has kind of happened and the ownership levels have gone down i would look it from a more optimistic angle, the reason being that in spite of such selling, we have not kind of corrected, uh, you know, as we would have done earlier in the history, right? Why? Well, because the domestic money flow has been fantastic. It has been a great support to the market. Now, if things get better from a global perspective, and if FPI start to have a very constructive view uh, about India, then there would be a very painful entry as well for them coming into Indian markets going forward, right? So, which means that if things stabilize from the global perspective, the rally can be a little more sharper than anticipated as well. Yeah, next question is what's your view on markets? Yeah, I think... Uh in last November and December, we actually turned, uh, you know, pretty cautious and we said that the first half of calendar year 2022 uh, would be extremely volatile. And the reason was basically that Fed actually had kind of turned around in terms of their stance in last September, October, right? Uh, of course, we didn't knew when we turned around our stand, we didn't knew that Russia and Ukraine is going to happen, but that kind of added to the complexity of inflation, right? Where inflation is now even more stickier uh, and because of which the Fed is even more hawkish and talking about 50 basis points rate hikes for the at least next two meetings as well. Now, till the time we do see inflation, you know, at elevated levels and till the time we do see that the central banks are continuing to be pretty hawkish, my view is basically the markets will continue to trade, uh, you know, pretty choppy and volatile uh, till then. Once you see inflation numbers kind of cooling, I think we should then, uh, you know, kind of stabilize and then start seeing some amount of recovery henceforth. So next question is what kind of returns one can expect from enhanced strategy? So, so, other, think, not the absolute, yeah. so enhanced return, to be very honest, as I said, is linked to benchmark. And I think the bigger call here is to take, uh, is to basically that, where is the market likely to head at least for the next three years? Because enhanced return is not a product for one year, right? It's an equity product and uh, it has to be viewed in the perspective of investing for three years. And why, when I see three years from now onwards, and I'm not talking about the next quarter, my view is basically that three years in, uh, you know, I think there should be sizable earnings growth, which can happen in the markets. Of course, P contraction or P expansion is something which will depend upon the liquidity which is available in the system. But the earnings growth trajectory, uh, I think, would be pretty robust and strong. And in that light, if you see, then equity markets, I think, should deliver uh, in line with the averages, long-term averages, uh, you know, and subsequently we can take a call of how Enhance does as well, uh, along with the benchmark. Your next question is about taxation. So I take this question on behalf of Weber. So here, as for the AIF regulation, uh, in CAD 3 AIF, if you look at all the taxation and everything is done at the instrument level, which means that instruments are liable to pay the taxes on your behalf and it happens for everyone. 
now coming back to the taxation slab that i would request vega to uh, give us the uh, exact number a and b is why it is on the higher side these two questions so aif category 3 uh, right uh, you know unfortunately doesn't doesn't enjoy a pass through status so because of which the categorization of income under aif uh according to us but uh, I, i would strongly recommend any investor to consult their uh, uh you know tax experts but in any case the longer term investments uh which is cash equities would be termed under the capital gains bucket whereas if you are gaining from a derivatives piece then you would be charged for that piece at mmr which is your maximum marginal rate which is about 42.74% right that's our understanding but of course as i said the caveat be uh, an individual investor along with their advisor should uh, you know consult your tax experts in any case agree with the disclaimer that you are requested to speak to your chartered accountant you know for any kind of taxation aspect or any stock which is discussed out here or anything on the market side we would request you to please discuss with your advisor or come to us we will give you complete uh, idea about that but do not invest directly just by listening to us uh, all right so uh, with that we would like to conclude the session here and uh, we would like to thank you webo for uh, joining the call and explaining the entire concept so nicely uh, so thank you so much so much of insights from you today as always thank you very much vikas it's always being a pleasure talking to you and 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 very happy to be on the platform thank all right you. so thank you my dear investors for joining in we have spent almost more than 45 minutes so thank you so much once again if you have any questions for webo you can write to me at vikas@aipms.com or reach out to our website uh, aipms.com i'll ensure that i'll reach out to webo and uh, get those questions answered thank you thank you